In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So these readings, when you bind them together into one, uh, may be described as pitfalls of our faith or a triptych through the journey of most of our, our, our faith experiences. Uh, we'll start with the first reading. And does anybody remember the first time you read this story? I remember my children's Bible, and partly because of the illustration itself, uh, but it had uh, all of the uh, uh, Israelites, when they built this calf, sort of looking like this. And they were like this big, and the calf was like 30 feet tall. Uh, and it begged the question, if they were freed from slavery, how did they have enough gold to build a, uh, a golden calf this big? And, uh, I think it might have been a little bit more like that, but even Charlton Heston uh, 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 misrepresented the size of the calf. Uh, but you have to ask yourself, and we look somewhat incredulously upon this story uh, because it seems kind of ridiculous to us. Uh, we think if any group of people should have had enough faith to let Moses disappear for a few days, it would have been the people that experienced uh, what these Israelites had experienced. Now, us, on the other hand, it's very easy for us to lose faith. I mean, uh, where's God been uh, in, in all of our lives? It's, it's, uh, sometimes we beg to have something as tangible and as concrete uh, as the Israelites have uh, because it's been more difficult for us to see God's hand at work. Uh, and I'll get back to that in a, in a moment. But, but think about the Israelites. So uh, they're held captive in slavery. Uh, uh, Moses experienced the burn, burning bush. Maybe he shared the story. Maybe he didn't. Uh, so he goes to the pharaoh. Uh, they go through all of the plagues. I mean, days without light, the whole Nile River turning red, uh, you know, name every one of the, 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 the plagues. Uh, they're spared. Their firstborn sons are spared. They're delivered out of slavery, and as they are fleeing, they look back, and they see that the Egyptians are coming after them, and they're trapped by the Red Sea. So Moses taps the ground, the Red Sea opens and divides so they can walk through the Red Sea. Have any of you ever had that happen in your life? They walk through the Red Sea, and then they turn back and it closes uh, after they get through so that they're safe. So they get into the wilderness for a while, um, just long enough to get a little bit grumpy, or uh, hangry as, uh, as, as my uh, wife and daughter call it, when you're hungry uh, and grumpy at the same time. Uh, and they're asking, where is God? And we're still thinking, have you not read the story? Did you not go through this whole thing? Where is God? We were better off as slaves. At least there we got food to eat. And then communion wafers, probably with the little cross already on them, fall from the heavens. I mean, communion wafers fall from the heavens, and not just once, every day. And then they eat, and then they get the quail that are coming in. You know, a Fauquier County would love to have quail coming in. Uh, uh, they get quail, they get the, 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 the wafers falling from heaven. And then they say, well, that's okay, but we were really thirsty, too, and uh, there's nothing to drink around here. So Moses taps a rock with his stick. Water gushes out so they can drink for days, and they're okay for a couple days. Then Moses goes on a field trip to talk to God, and all of a sudden, well, we better find somebody to worship. You know? So they build this calf, and we're thinking to ourselves, this is the most ridiculous group of people. Have a little faith. We are part of the wealthiest generation, materially, we have more than any group of people have ever had in history. Uh, and we live in a part of the world where we have more than anybody else for the rest of the world in this particular moment in history. We have been blessed, at least materially, uh, with more than anybody could imagine. Maybe they're putting on glasses and saying to us, don't they realize how much God has blessed them? Don't they see all of the blessings? You know, when they get into those valleys, they keep asking, where is God? When life gets difficult, when a loved one gets sick, they're saying, where is God? But they fail to see that God has been all around them. Maybe our story looks as incredulous uh, to the people in that, that story, uh, the Israelites, as their story is to us. And maybe it's part of our job as people of faith to step back and put on different glasses and try to see a little more carefully and try to show other people a little more clearly where God might be in their lives. Second piece I took from that same reading, and I think this is important as well. Uh, do you notice that in the end of that reading, God changes his mind? 
flesh. I think one of the stumbling blocks of our faith is we feel like God gets trapped inside the book of Scripture. And the same God that's worried about eating shellfish uh, and, and women wearing uh, uh, head coverings doesn't seem like the God that connects with what life looks like in 2017. Uh, and I take great assurance in the number of times in Scripture where God changes God's mind. God bends towards humanity. God changes over the thousands of years that are represented in Scripture. Uh, God changes his mind about, uh, about the treatment of the eunuch. God changes his mind about uh, the purpose of relationships. God changes his mind about uh, the wrath. God changes his mind in the story of the Syrophoenician woman about who is to inherit the, uh, uh, the graces, who is God's beloved people. God bends and adapts to God's people throughout history. And that's very reassuring. And that binds God to me in 2017 in a very concrete way. But sometimes I need to be reminded of that. Then we have the epistle, where I am not going to try to say the two women's names. Uh, uh, although I will say Kate did a beautiful job of saying the names. I was very, very impressed. Um, uh, Syntax and Eubius? Eubius? I mean, Eubius. Well, these two women are clearly leaders in the church, uh, but they're having a conflict. Uh, and Paul is writing because this conflict is destroying the, the church. They're taking sides. Uh, there's the Syntex side, and then there's the other side. Um, and, and the church is becoming divided over these two leaders in the church. Uh, and, um, and it's the first and only church conflict that the church has ever had uh, in the 2,000 years that the church has existed. <laughs> I think one of the big pitfalls of church, a number of people who said, well, I used to go there, but then there was a fight, or I dissed the rector I didn't get along with, or uh, the, the altar guild, there was something going on, or some other committee, or I was in a Bible study, and we didn't see eye to eye on things, or that church leans too much this way, or that church leans too much that way. In fact, there's the joke that I may have shared, or if you might not have been paying close enough attention, so I'll share it again. Huh? <laughs> so there's the guy who's been living on a deserted island all by himself, that's part of what deserted means, uh, all by himself, uh, and is finally, after years and years, rescued. And the people rescuing him notice that there's three huts. And they say to him, I thought you were alone here on the island, all by yourself. And they said, oh, I was. And they said, well, explain the three different buildings. And he said, well, that's my house. And he was very proud of it, showed him all the house. Uh, and he went to the uh, um, next one, and, and they said, well, what's this? And he said, well, that's my church. Uh, I mean, every, uh, every faithful person needs a place to worship. Uh, and he says, great, great. And then, well, what's the third place? And he said, well, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> One of the things that trips us up in our walk of faith uh, is our inability to get along or to deal with people who think differently than us, even though we're called to be in a relationship uh, that looks like the kingdom of God, that has the diversity of the kingdom of God. We have parts of our service, uh, the confession against God and our neighbor, uh, that we ask for forgiveness. We have the peace where we're called to reconcile with one another. We come up and share a meal shoulder to shoulder in communion with one another. And Paul reminds us uh, that we need to focus our mind uh, not on what divides us, uh, but on our unity in Christ, on what we have in common, uh, that we are the body of Christ, that we are gathered uh, subject and, uh, and, and worship uh, and um, in love with, with Christ, our maker and our being. And then we have the gospel reading, which is the reading that actually makes me now, uh, whenever somebody says they want to be baptized uh, or they want their child baptized, and it's not one of the four baptismal uh, occasions, uh, it makes me not just check my calendar to see if I'm available, but check the gospel to see what's going to be read that day. Uh, because 12 years ago, uh, this particular Sunday, uh, when my son was baptized and I had to preach, uh, we could only get the relatives and friends in on this particular day, and I got ready to prepare my sermon, which is hard enough to write a sermon for your son's baptism, uh, but when it ends with weeping and gnashing of teeth, uh, <laughs> and someone getting thrown out of church for not wearing the proper garment, you know, uh, you, you're, you're not sure where you're going to go with it. Uh, but this has been a gospel that's really confounded people, and it's a difficult gospel. Um, it's a parable, and I think uh, part of what makes it so difficult is the king is a very unlikable person. And the archetype that we take for the king, uh, because we've just had that parable of the, of the vineyard, uh, uh, you know, where, where it's pretty clear that the prophets uh, and Jesus were the ones that came before, and uh, the landowner, the vineyard owner, is, the, is, the, is, is God, uh, that it, we quickly put God as, as the king. And, and I think God is the king, uh, but I don't think the personality of the king is modeled specifically after uh, 
after God. I think it's more based on what their experience of kings were, more like Herod. Uh, but the king is the king, and he's holding a, a, a banquet. What would have happened for a wedding banquet is he would have invited people uh, well in advance, uh, but, uh, but it's sort of a save the date that you put on your refrigerator, uh, or not a refrigerator. Uh, but, you know, to save the day. But then when all the preparations are made, uh, then you send your slaves out, if you're of that class, and they would bring everybody in. Uh, and uh, you would uh, absolutely clear your schedule to be there. And these weddings or banquets would last days and days. And there were occasion for great celebration and great joy. Uh, and the family's pride uh, is in incredibly wrapped into this. And so you have this giant wedding uh, celebration. All of the food has been prepared. Uh, so much has been put into it. And you go and you tell people, remember that invitation? Well, time is now. Come here. And everybody's too busy. They've got things to do. And the prophets are the slaves that went out to tell them about it, and they were either ignored or mistreated, or people didn't have time for them, or they were even killed. Um, and then so the, 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 the wedding banquet is opened up. The opportunity for joy and celebration is opened up uh, to all people. And they're brought in, good, bad, and realize who the judge is. The judge is not uh, the slaves. The judge is not the doorkeeper. Uh, the judge is God. So we can get rid of the, the judging business. Uh, but they all come to the banquet, um, and one comes unprepared. Now, the first half of the parable, I think, is the importance of showing up. When you're invited, show up. When you're invited to the kingdom of God, show up. Take the time to show up. The other part is the fact that 80% might be showing up, but it's not 100%. How you show up matters. This has nothing to do with what you wear to church. This has to do with how you show up. You know, showing up might be 80%. Uh, but if you show up for a math test and you have no idea what's going on, you're not going to get an 80% just because you said, I showed up and showed, showing up is 80%. Uh, I'm sure there's not many baseball or soccer coaches that would say, I know, you guys played horribly, but you showed up. So that's 80% good. You know, it takes an intentionality. We are showing up for the kingdom of God. God has invited us to partake in God's heavenly kingdom. God has invited us to a feast that is beyond all measure and wants more than our bleary-eyed, half-invested, extended hand. God wants our hearts, our minds, our bodies. God wants us. And he wants us to show up like it matters. I'd say one of the great gifts of what I do, one of the greatest gifts of this job, one of the things that affirms that I'm doing what God's called me to do uh, is the fact that I get to participate in the whole of people's lives. I have the privilege of being there when new children are born, daughters, sons, grandsons, granddaughters. I get to be there for weddings. I get to be there when there's trouble, when people aren't getting along, and I get to try to help heal broken wounds. I get to be there in hospital rooms, funeral parlors, difficult times, but it's still holy times. I have the privilege of being there, bringing God into the, the depths of life. But there are times where I come and I'm not as present as I should be. And many of you may have experienced that. You get invited to, uh, uh, to a party celebrating some milestone in the family's life. Uh, and you think, okay, we'll drop by. Uh, we've got a whole lot on our calendar today, but we'll make an appearance. We'll show up 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll, we'll go to whatever we have next. Uh, and you show up, and you realize that it was a more intimate gathering than you expected. Or you realize that your presence meant more than you thought it did. And you realize you kind of half showed up for something that needed your whole heart, that deserved your whole attention, something that was incredibly important to that person or that family. God wants more than just our bottoms and a fuse. God wants our minds and bodies shifted towards celebrating God's grace and God's goodness. Grace is a free gift. But it's one that has to be intentionally received. So each one of these readings strung together pretty much epitomizes our journey of faith and all the things that happen along the way. But God wants us to pursue him fully, intentionally, through all of the pitfalls, to the joyous end. Amen.